We have been journeying through the Old Testament. We've only gotten through like nine chapters. Uh, and in that nine chapters, the first nine chapters, we've dealt with Adam and Eve in creation. We've dealt with the fall of man. We've dealt with Noah. And then, of course, there's questions that come. But l- let me say this. Uh, this is um, this is God's word, but there's so much more to God than this, and I can't answer all your questions because uh, there, there's only like stories from this. Uh, people go like, "Okay, so we all came from Adam." Yes, we all came from Adam. We all come from the seed of Adam, which is why you're born with a sinful nature. And then God wiped out the the world and was left with Noah. And uh, he was found to be the the most righteous man on earth. So you guys came from Noah. And then he told Noah to procreate, repopulate the world. And everybody goes, well, how did he do that? Uh, with just the people that were on the boat. And I take you back to Genesis 7-7. Seven, seven. It says, So Noah, his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives entered the ark because of the floodwaters. Then you go, okay, so does that mean that fam- fam- they were having kids within the family and how had all that? I don't know. Can't answer that. I know some of you will theologically go to other places in the scripture and uh, make uh, pondering thoughts about that, and uh, it's all good. Uh, I, I do know this. It got to Genesis chapter 9, verse 28, and it says, Now Noah lived 350 years after the flood, so Noah's life lasted 950 years. Oh, Lord. <laughs> 950 years on this earth. Uh, Then he died. Then he died. And you go into Genesis chapter 10, and it is basically the the genealogy of Noah's sons, which was Sham, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, And you get into chapter 11, and it's the story that everybody's intrigued by, which is the Tower of Babel, and it's only nine verses long. Like, you think about if that's one of those prominent stories in the scripture is the Tower of Babel, it's nine verses long. That's all we've got. And basically, it talks about them building these clay bricks and building a tower to the sky. It doesn't say to God, but to the sky. And God says, okay, this isn't a good thing, so we're going to like... Uh, scatter them, give them different languages. And so they end up scattering over the region. And people then (laughs) ask the question, well, uh, what about race? Where does race come into the whole (coughs) chart of things? And again, the Bible doesn't provide specific details about the origin of different colors of skin. Uh, However, it does emphasize that all humans are descended from this common ancestry of Noah. The diversity in skin color and other physical traits can be understood really as a part of the genetic variation that God built into the community. Like when he literally disbanded that group and spread them out into different regions, he is God and he is the creator of humans, and he can change things. It's my only explanation. (laughs) That's it. As people migrated and settled in different regions, they adapted to different environmental conditions, and over time, genetics and variations happened. So then you get to, uh, really, chapter 11 I'll show you uh, is kind of how we got from Noah to Abram. There is the genealogy from Noah to Abram. 
It's all happened in chapter 11. I'm not going to sit there and read all those names and butcher them. <laughs> chapter 12, this is where we pick up. It says, <clears throat> the Lord said to Abram, go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's a pretty big promise. This is the Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, the song, and I am one of them, and so are you. It says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot... Lot, being his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem, at the Oak of Morah. You all are sitting here going, I don't know any of these places. That's all right, hang on. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar from there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. He built an altar to the Lord there, and he called the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. Now, Let's show you where this is. I like my maps. I think you all like your maps as well. But if you'll look up here, I didn't bring my laser with me. Uh, at the very top, the very top, let's just back up. You see the one point up there in the mountainous area, that's Mount Ararat. In that region somewhere is where Noah's Ark landed. And then it says the people went out from the regions at the very top. Then you'll see below that, directly below that, is Nineveh, and to the left of that, the west of that, is Haran. This is where Abraham was living with his wife, his nephew, and all of his possessions. And then, uh, just let me show you what modern-day map looks like. This is the modern-day map, same area, same region. So you've got Israel right here, you've got Syria right here, Lebanon right there, You've got Turkey up in the, up in the left top there, uh, and this is where he was. He was in Turkey, basically. Haran is where he was, and let, obviously you've got Egypt down here. Let, let's move on to the next map. This is what the land of Canaan, he said, when God promised him the land of Canaan, everybody's like, well, what's the land of Canaan? Is that Israel? Actually, it was more than Israel. If you look at Israel, there's a, the Jordan River that runs right down the middle of it right here, the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee at the top. Israel's to the west of that. Jordan is to the east of that. At the top, where it says Hittites, that is Lebanon. To the right, where it says Bashan, that is Syria. And then down here, where it says the Philistines, is the Gaza Strip. All this coming in clear. It says that Abram came down through the land of Canaan, and he stopped at Bethel, which is right here in the middle, just west of Jericho. Jerusalem being just south of it. And then also it mentions Ai, which is just east of Bethel. This is the region that he went to. And then he came down to Negev, which is down here close to Egypt. So literally, Abram traveled through the land of Canaan, stopping there in the middle to set up the altars. Is there more maps? This is the trek that he came through. You'll see that he started at the top, he came to the Euphrates River, went west, came down through 
Lebanon, Syria, and went through Israel and made his way south of Israel. That's it. Make sense? Just what we read, you can see on the map. Now, uh, you get to Genesis chapter 12, and it's interesting because now there's a famine in this land. This land of Canaan that was promised to Abram, there's a famine going on. So he goes down to Egypt with his wife Sarah and their belongings, and he tells Pharaoh that Sarai is his sister, not his wife, but his sister, because Sarai is a beautiful young woman. She's beautiful, and Pharaoh finds favor with Abram's wife, Sarai, so much that he begins to give Abram livestock, silver and gold, and all these things. Like, he... He's so fascinated with Abram's sister, which is actually Abram's wife, that he takes her as his own wife. That's messed up. But here we go. Plagues begin to happen to Pharaoh and to his men. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh discovers that Sarai is actually Abram's wife. And he goes to Abram and says, why did you lie to me? Why did you lie to me? He confronts Abram and literally says, you must leave with Sarai and go back. And he gives him all these things and says, be gone. So Abram walks away from Egypt, goes back to the land of Canaan, and he's got all this stuff. He's there with Lot. He's living in Canaan now at this time with his nephew Lot, and they have so much possessions, so much livestock, that they begin to argue about land and everything else. And so Lot decides, okay, I'm going to go over to Jordan and take all my possessions, my livestock, and go over there, and he goes to a place called Sodom, and he lives there in Sodom. That's in Genesis chapter 13. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 16, here's what happens. There's five kings up in the north in the Syria-Lebanon area, and there's four kings in the south near Sodom. And the five kings in the north decide, we're going to take over the four kings in the south and take all their stuff. They come down, they literally take Lot and his family, and they move him north. They've taken all of their possessions. Abram finds out about it, and he's literally living in the middle of the land of Canaan, and he has made a treaty with one of the landowners there, one of the Canaanites there, and through his men, through his men, uh, he builds this army of 318 men. And he decides to go rescue his nephew Lot from the kings in the north. It's a great story. But it's it's also short in verse. We really don't have a lot of details. So Abram takes these 318 men and he travels up to Dan, which is the north part of the land of Canaan. And he chases them all, all the way up north, almost back to Haran. And he defeats the kings, he gets Lot, and he brings them back, and Lot goes back to Sodom. But on his way back, here's an interesting thing, is he comes through the land of Dan, the land of Dan, and when you go to Israel with me, those of you that have been with me, there's a place that as you enter through the city of Dan, there was a gate that Abram came through. And this is what it looked like. They believe this is the gate that Abram actually walked through to get through the city of Dan, which is pretty amazing. It's one of the best excavations in the land of Israel, is to know that, just just think back how long ago that was. So now everything has come back. We're into Genesis chapter 14, 
verses 17. It says, After Abram returned from defeating Kadalamir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in Shava Valley. That is the king's valley. Melchizedek, kind of an important name. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to the God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, a high priest. We learn about Melchizedek in Hebrews as being an eternal priest. And Jesus was a shadow, it was not the shadow, but the real eternal priest. It says, Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take thread or sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the share of men who came with me, Anir, Eshkel, and Mamre, they can take their share. Those were the men that he made a treaty with in Canaan. And he's like, they can have theirs, but I don't need any of this. And then we get to Genesis 15. And I think this is one of the most important passages of Scripture in the book of Genesis. It says, After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what, what can you give me? Since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. He's literally saying, I don't have any kids. The only people in my house are the children of my servants. He says, Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring. So a slave born in my house will be my heir. Everything that I have will go to my slave's child. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them. Then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abram, he's at least 75, is like looking at the stars going... Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Like, I'm going to have a kid at 75 years old. It says, verse 6, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. When I was eight years old, I was sitting at First Baptist Church, Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the midst of a revival. <laughs> and I, at the invitation, I got up and I walked down the aisle with my sister Heidi. And I knelt beside Dr. Warren C. Hulkerin, the pastor. And I prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That, that prayer, I thought, was what saved me. And I've come to find out years later it wasn't. It wasn't this special prayer. It wasn't because I got up and walked down the aisle. I simply look here and go, Abram believed the Lord. And because he believed the Lord, he credited it to him as righteousness. Like he received credit for being righteous. Abram at that point was not made righteous. He couldn't be made righteous. There's only one thing that makes a person righteous. And that's the belief in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Once you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, 
you're made righteous. If I pulled two cards out of my wallet right now, one being a credit card and one being a gift card, there's a big difference. The credit card is what Abraham had. In other words, he was credited righteousness, but there was a time when that bill had to be paid. And that bill wasn't going to be paid at the altar or temple or anything like that. It was going to be paid by Jesus Christ dying on the cross and his blood being poured out. That was the payment for Abram's righteousness. So in other words, he never received righteousness, although he received credit for it. You, on the other hand, are born after the cross. The cross has already occurred. And the moment that you believe, you're made righteous. You have the gift card. And it is an unlimited gift card. There's a big difference between a credit card and a gift card. The gift card has already been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you, my friends, are the righteousness of Christ. You have been made righteous. I'm literally looking at you right now and see you as righteous people. You're holy, forgiven, redeemed Children of God, that's who you are. When, when Matt talks about identity, know this is who you are. Yeah, I still, I still blow it. I still sin. I still make bad choices. I still chase my flesh. I get it, but that's not who I am. Don't make that my identity. My identity is solely in Jesus. That's what's eternal. That's what is lasting forever. My flesh, it all goes away. (laughs) It's going away. (laughs) And the moment that I'm out of this earth suit, this, this flesh body, my soul and my spirit is present with the Lord, and that's who I am. I I don't have to I don't have to wait to be made righteous. I don't have to die to be made righteous. It's not some position that I hold here on earth and then I get it and attain it someday later. I'm made righteous right now. It's what he did for me. I didn't do anything other than believe. That's all Abram did. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. And so all that getting up and going down and invitation and praying and even being baptized, yeah, that was part of my experience But what simply saved me is I believed Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, and that he died for my sins. That belief is what saved me. Look, I don't think we've ever done an invitation here in all the years (laughs) at Pinheads or, or whatever. We haven't, because that's not what saves you. Yeah, I know people have come to know the Lord and have come to receive salvation through this ministry, there's no question about hearing the word of God and responding to the word of God and just simply saying, yeah, I believe. I believe Jesus. It's that simple. It really is that simple. He made it really easy so you didn't have to do anything other than believe. Yet we try to churn salvation out. We keep trying to pedal faster. We'll get to that here in just a second. Uh, I want to read through Genesis chapter 16. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, Since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, and, and go to my slave. Perhaps through her I can build a family. This is in total contrast to what God had told Abram already. Like Abram said, you're going to have many children. It says, So Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for ten years. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress became contemptible to her. 
Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge between me and you. (laughs) I'm not even commenting on that. Abram replied to Sarai, Here, your slave is in your power. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Like he didn't already know. She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. Now, not only was Abram promised numerous amounts of offspring, but now Hagar has been promised numerous amounts of offspring. The angel of the Lord said to her, You have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will settle near all of his relatives. So she named the Lord who spoke to her. You are Elroy, for she said, In this place I have actually seen the one who sees me. That is why this well is called Bir Laha Roy. It was between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. 86-year-old got a newborn That's the story of Ishmael. I could break that down and go into that, but we're doing a flyover. Now we get to this another important part here. Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I'm God Almighty, 99 years old. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will set up my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. This is kind of like the same thing that he said earlier to Abram. He's saying it again. Then Abram fell face down and God spoke with him. As for me, here is my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant, permanent, that he's making with Abraham. He says, to be your God and the God of your offspring after you, and you and to you and your future offspring I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. That land that we just looked at, God promised to Abraham and his chosen people. We're literally living in the present battle of that land. Like, the United States is involved in that battle for that land. It says, God also said to Abraham, as for you and your offspring after you throughout their generation are to keep my covenant. Oh, so now this is a conditional covenant that I'm making this covenant with you. It's permanent, but you're also making this covenant with me. This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, which you are to keep. Every one of your males must be circumcised. Hmm. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. You, you go, why that? <laughs> why that? Because the word that he is using here is permanent. And once that foreskin is removed, it dies. And it's not going to be reattached. You're not going back and changing that. It's a permanent thing. It says, 
Throughout your generations, every male among you is to be circumcised at eight days old. Every male born in your household or purchased from any foreigner, not your offspring. Whether born in your household or purchased, he must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as a permanent covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. This is for the Jews. This is for God's chosen people. It's for the Jews. It's not for the Gentiles. God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. Ooh, he's 99 years old. (laughs) I will bless her and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed. (laughs) I don't know if I'd laugh or cry. (laughs) He laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael were acceptable to you. Why do we have to go through this when we've got Ishmael? But God said, No. Your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac, which means laughter. I will confirm my covenant with him as a permanent covenant for his future offspring. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will confirm my covenant with Isaac whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with him, God withdrew from Abraham. (laughs) That that in itself, that that line right there, God withdrew from him, like they're literally just having a conversation. You're having a conversation with God. says, so Abraham took his son Ishmael and those born in the household and purchased every male among the members of Abraham's household and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin on that very day just as God had said to him. Abram was 99 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. Ah. And his son Ishmael was 13 years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised. On that very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his household, whether born in his household or purchased from a foreigner, were circumcised with them. Ooh, that's a historic day. They didn't have operating rooms. You end the story here. You end the story here and know that this was a covenant that was made with Abraham and the Jewish people. And here's what you have to know. Is Genesis chapter 15 came before Genesis chapter 17. When did Abraham receive his credit for righteousness? Before he had to do anything. Before he had to do anything. The circumcision was after he believed. After he received his credit for righteousness. All he did was believe. Then all of a sudden he's having to do things. Then we get to Exodus and you get the Ten Commandments. And you got to live by the Ten Commandments. you got to live by the law. And you have to do all these things. And the whole Old Covenant's about doing, doing, doing. And it's a conditional, conditional covenant that God made with his Jewish people. You do this and I will bless you. You don't do this or you do something wrong, I'll curse you. And that's the whole old covenant. It was everything was being done in their strength, in their own power, in their own flesh. And they proved they couldn't do it over and over and over and over and over again. But for you, but for you, I close with this. I'm going to read from a different translation because it's just easier for you to understand. But Romans chapter 2, verse 28 says this. For you are not a true Jew, 
just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. He's talking to the Jews. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. In other words, those of you that have believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been circumcised. It is a spiritual circumcision. And it is not a circumcision of the foreskin. It is a circumcision of the heart. Your old heart has been taken out and replaced with a new heart. The moment that you believe, I didn't know this at eight years old. I didn't know this when I believed. I learned this a lot later in life. But I'd been given a new heart. I was made a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Everything changed the moment that I believed. I no longer had a sinful nature. I was a new creature. I was, I was holy. I was righteous. I redeemed. And I didn't figure it out until a lot later in life. I was taught to do religion. I was taught to do things. I was taught to live by the law. I was taught, I was taught, I was taught. Until one day, the Spirit taught me different. That I don't have to do anything. I'm already there. I'm already, as Hebrews says, perfect. Yeah, I still blow it. But I've been redeemed. I'm forgiven. I am the righteousness of Christ. That's who I am. I have a new heart. My circumcision has taken place spiritually. He's made me new. He's made you new. Now the rest of my life, the rest of my life, the rest of your journey is learning how to live out of that new heart that you've been giving. That's why you're here. I hope that's why you're here is that you're figuring out how to learn, learning how to live out of this new heart. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be made holy, to be separate from the world, to be separate from all the junk that we're dealing with right now? To be the light of the world in a dark, dark, dark world. You are the light of the world. Father, my prayer is that we figure this thing out that you've already done so much in us that we can't even like fathom, we can't even grasp, that may your spirit inside of us teach us and remind us that each and every day that we are holy, we are separate from the muck in this fallen world, this crazy messed up world. But because of you, uh, we can live life abundantly and full. We can smile today. We have reason to be joyful today because of all that you've done in our lives. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.